Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneka Wakis porter You must be prepared to ignite. Hey, it is time for another epic episode of the Entrepreneur New Podcast. I am your host and mastermind beyond the show, Henneka Watkins Porter. And I'm so thrilled to welcome back all my faithful listeners and a warm welcome to all the newbies tuning in for the first time. Last week, we had the pleasure of chatting with Rob Buffington, and he's a genius behind a remote staffing company that exploded from 25 to a whopping 400 employees in just two years. Now this week, get ready to be blown away by our guest, a non-techie course creator turned tech boss. She got fed up with all the techie headaches of managing a thriving online course community and decided to take matters into her own hands by creating her own custom course platform with her partner. Before we dive in, though, let's give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsor, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, who has been backing the show like a boss for years now. We couldn't have done it without you, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, so thank you. So stick around for their message, and then we'll get right into our chat with our badass guest. Are you ready? to be inspired let's do this but first a word from our sponsor we needed to raise capital but our experience with local financial institutions was that they were cautious and slow to act and interest rates were far too high we had real concerns about financing our business through outside equity investors and the possibility of interference could we get a fair valuation for our business We had our own ideas about the business and its value. Should I go the traditional route of bank financing or should I try the Jamaica Stock Exchange? So we made a call and experienced transformation of our business through conversations. I'm John Mafood, CEO of Jamaican Tees, and we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Give us a call today at 876-967-3271 to begin your transformation through conversation. We want to see your company listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Alison Marshall is my guest on episode 312 of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. Alyssa is the co-founder of Olish, a software as a service SaaS that helps non-technical creators like myself embed awesome looking online courses into their websites without the help of a developer. Having received her DDS in both South Korea and the United States, Alyssa practiced dentistry before becoming an entrepreneur. In 2013, she created an educational hub providing online courses and remote training for dentists looking to take their careers to the next level. And this venture led her Yes, led her to retire as a dentist at age 31. And as a non-technical course creator, Alyssa grew frustrated with the various technical challenges of hosting a thriving online course community. The constant back and forth with developers to make simple changes and the complexity of maintaining a separate course site led her and her partner, Kevin, to develop their custom course platform, which eventually became Olish. Welcome, Aliso. Hey, Hanukkah. Thank you so much for having me and for that awesome intro. Thank you so much for being here. All right. So, Aliso, what do you know about the Jamaican culture, if anything? Uh, That the food is amazing Ah. and that the people are extremely friendly. And that is where my knowledge ends. Enlighten Ah. me. Well, you, you, you kind of, you're off to a really great start because food always, they say is a staff of life, right? Yes. Um, and you get to somebody's heart <laughs> by giving yes. them good food. So yeah, we have great food. Our people, warm and friendly. And yes, we know some things get out in the media 
Um, but that is just a minute percentage of who our people really are, you know. Um, we are warm and friendly. We're very hospitable. We we go out. We go all out when we, you know, when we're when we are um, welcoming and hosting others from different parts of the world. So and that's a great place to start, of course. Or you know, culture goes beyond that. Or music. Oh my gosh, when we think oh, about right. yeah, Bob Marley and you know. Um, all the others that have come up, the the Marcia Griffiths, and in the current we have the Chronics and the Coffee and amazing people who continue to fly the flag, the Jamaican flag high. Of course, Bob Marley through his music lives on. And then we have the grades of Shelley and Fraser Price and Usain Bolt and Asafa Powell and all of those grades as it relates to uh, athletics. So we have a lot to be grateful for, not to mention how naturally endowed we are with resources or land or landscape or mountains or oceans or seas or rivers. It's just amazing that we have the best fruits. All right, so don't oh, get me started, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back on track. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, from dentist to tech entrepreneur. So, just tell us about your background and how it led you to become a co-founder of Owlish. I guess I should really start where I realized entrepreneurship is a potential path for me because I was in dental school and really all throughout my education, I was a very narrow minded person in that I never thought I would be veering off track. It never even occurred to me as a possibility. When I was in dental school and I went to dental school twice, once in South Korea and once in the U.S., my thoughts about the future literally were, oh, yeah, I'll have a dental office and maybe I'll even have two or three and have some associate dentists. And that's cool. That that was really the extent. And it wasn't like I ever thought I love this. It was just I, I, I made it into dental school right out of high school. That's how it's done in Korea and most of the parts, other parts of the world, by the way, um, it being a graduate study is like a North American thing for the U.S. and like Canada. But in most other parts of the world, you're choosing this career right out of high school. So you are young. And I don't know about most other high schoolers, but I didn't know anything about myself, really. Like, I feel like I really matured into myself in my late 20s, 30s. I did well enough in school tests and in school to get into dental school because it was extremely competitive. And when I did, I was like, okay, that's, this is my life now. And I did not even look outside of that track for my entirety of my twenties. I started in when I was 20, six years in Korea, and then two years before I could start my dental school in the U S again, and then another two years in the U S. So that's 10 years, my entire twenties devoted to dentistry gone. Right. Anyway, I was in my senior year of dental school in UCLA and a friend of mine, I don't know how exactly this happened, but he gives me Tim Ferriss's audiobook, the four hour work week. And I wasn't even a book reader or a listener or anything like that. I didn't know audiobooks were even a thing, but anyway, he's like, you just need to listen to this. Just, just listen. So I was like, okay, whatever. Um, I was in the lab working on my patient cases like late at night, senior year, like trying to finish at the requirements so I can graduate on time, this kind of thing. And listening to his book and I'm just like, oh my God. First of all, I didn't know that this kind of path was even a thing. And second of all, it sounded extremely tempting. It made me dream for the first time in like forever, because when I wasn't like throughout high school years, my only thing that I had in mind was like, I wanted to get into a good professional career so that I would have stability throughout my adult life. That was my only goal. It wasn't like, oh, I dream of becoming a dentist. That wasn't even me. Anyway, so my world was literally turned upside down because of this book. And that's when I started dreaming. And I was at that time with my, I was dating my now husband and it really got us thinking about what we could do. He was also in corporate. He was in IT and him too. It wasn't like he really loved his job, but it was just more like, you know, we're not really thinking about how are we going to change our careers. We were more thinking about how are we going to spend our weekends, you know, having fun. But that com that entire conversation changed now to, okay, maybe our work lives can actually be more, 
be more fulfilling and more fun. And so, yeah, that's what led me to start dreaming and tinkering and just trying ventures. All right. And Fast Track, you know, have Owlish. What sets it apart from other online course platforms? Owlish was born because of my own frustrations. So I am not the type of person that just takes on to a new technical thing or anything like that easily. I am not on TikTok, just all the little tech hurdles and something as seemingly as like whatever easy as TikTok even it's it, for me is like a big mental barrier to like I don't want to really try a new thing on my any of my devices like I am not I don't like to code I just don't know how to code I don't want to learn I kind of tried to learn a little bit when I was in the very early days and I was just like oh, this is so not me and I had all these online courses that we were running, except that I just felt handicapped. I felt disempowered because our all of our courses were hosted on WordPress. And it was okay when we had like one course on WordPress, I'd be able to log into the back end and make changes or whatever, small changes, no, nothing big. But I felt comfortable, let's say, changing the uh, the sequence of the course around or adding new modules and lessons to the course, whatever, things like this, I could handle that. But when we started having more than one course, the WordPress backend got messy real fast. And it got to the point where I didn't want to log in because I couldn't figure out what anything was. It was just this chaos. And that kind of chaos it made me kind of shut down and like not look at it versus like dive in because it because it was technical it was like a back end of something and so i would either go to my husband or my developer and ask for help for the seemingly smallest of things and i just it was frustrating if it was my developer then she or he would do it for me. But it just felt like I was asking for the littlest thing. You know, like how a kid asks for a snack because they can't do it themselves. I kind of felt like that. Like I was that kid because the simplest things I couldn't figure out by myself. And I didn't like that feeling. And if I had to ask my husband, then it would go to the bottom of his to-do list, right? Not the top of it. And he already has a long list of things to do himself. And so it never, it, and then I would be like, Hey, did you do this? He'd be like, no, no, I'll get to it. And then it would just not happen on the timeline that I wanted slash needed it to happen. It just wasn't a very good experience for neither my husband or myself. And so we had conversations about how to make this process easier for me. It really just started for, for me so many times. And then it just led to this like, oh, WordPress is just not it. To do WordPress, you have to be pretty comfortable with tech yourself. And if you don't, as a as the course creator, it's there are a lot of moments of discomfort enough to deter you from making progress in your own business. And so, yeah, all those brainstorming sessions just to how to help me <laughs> manage my business better led us to the dreaming up of this new platform where the course did not have to live on WordPress, but it could live on any other platform so that and the process of putting the course up on the site does, didn't have to be complicated. Like the back end needs to be simple and intuitive in a way where you wouldn't need like a developer to do so. I, I don't think there is anything like that on WordPress. I think like, though, like, like Calendly, for instance, is a really good example of a simple piece of software that helps non-technical people create meetings and set meetings up very easily. It is not hard. And that is kind of what I wanted for the course experience. And so, yeah, that's how Owlish was born. And what sets up us apart is that it allows you to not have to struggle <laughs> in your own website's back end trying to figure out how to put up a course, but instead you have a dedicated LMS, which is a learning management software, where you get to easily handle your course experience. And then all you have to do is put in a snippet of, a snippet of code 
in your footer of your website where you want the course to show up and then it shows up. You don't need a developer for it. It is so much easier. It is such a weight off your shoulders if you've been through a struggle like I have. Wow. So I want you to zone in a little more, um, Alisa. How does Olish, you know, help these non-technical creators like myself embed online courses into our websites without the help of a developer? Most non-technical people, I am going to guess, have their websites not, unless they work really closely with a developer, they mostly have simpler, easy to use websites. So their website could all either be on like a Wix or Weebly or some some pl- platform like that where it's it's made to be a non like a no code platform. And it's made for the person who wants a beautiful looking website, like a Squarespace, for instance, a beautiful looking website. And but it's, you know, it has these templates. And so you don't have to code up all of this thing from from scratch, right? The problem when you have a website like that and you're just thinking, oh, now I my business is to the point where I want to add a course to the site. You have two options. You can either look into how to add a course to your own existing website, which is what I wanted. That is what I like personally for myself. Or you can look at, there are several platforms that are easy itself, quote, quote, unquote, easy itself, where you can have a dedicated course website. So it is your website, but it's like you have to manage a secondary website outside of your own main website. And that website experience is dedicated to your course experience, where you'll have to basically send people off of, let's say, your own website, your homepage, um, your members and the course, the course learners of yours will have to log into a separate website to be able to access your course. And for me, I did not like this. It didn't feel like a um, flowing experience for them. It was asking them to remember the URL or like, you know, like they had to keep it somewhere um, instead of just be going be being able to go to your own web homepage, which if they signed up for your course or whatever, they usually remember your name or, you know, the website URL. Um, instead of just being able to go there and access the course, you had to link it out to another second website. And it was two websites to manage instead of one. And that didn't sit well with me. I didn't like that, which is why when we did it, we did it on WordPress, even though it was a technical really big headache, (laughs) technically a really big headache. At least we were able to keep people on our own website instead of sending them out. Um, But yeah, so the thing that sets that Owlish really focused on is the ability to keep your own website, not having to open up a second website that you need to like now design and manage on your own and people send people here and there and go back and forth and all this stuff. But instead, you could just have it on your own website. It's not a big deal. My naive self, before I started the whole online courses thing, and I still remember this, I thought that like, oh, well, what's the big deal about putting an online course on your website? You can just like put up videos on Vimeo or Wistia and then you can link the pages together. You can be like, okay, we can put in a little button that says next lesson. And then you, if you click it, you'll make it so that it's hyperlinked to the next page. Like what's the big deal until I realized when I was actually doing the course, it was a gigantic deal because you couldn't um, easily change the layout or update make updates to the courses without breaking something because we can only hold so much in our brains in terms of like what how to manage things so like I would like to want to insert a new lesson in between but then I would forget to hyperlink them correctly and so nobody would either see it because it you know, I didn't actually change the flow of the course, or I would hyperlink one of them and not the other one. And it was just this big mess. So if you want an online course, you really do need a a learning management platform of some kind, it can be a plugin, or it can be a whatever, like it can be a dedicated software, like a dedicated website that does that, but you need really, really need something. But if you want it just to be on your site, there are not many ways to do that unless you are using a platform like WordPress, which is extremely challenging for the non-technical group of people. So Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, these peeps, you can't really put it up there. Webflow, like there aren't 
apps, if that makes sense. There, there's just no way. Like, on that, the only way to put it up on those websites is to hack it together, like the way I said with like hyperlinks and stuff. And I do not wish that for anybody. And so, at, at this time and point, um, Owlish is the only one that integrates with all of these platforms to be able to. Uh, to help you get your courses onto your site really seemingly easily without you having to go through a whole bunch of headache and hassle so that you can actually like focus on your actual course experience instead of all the technical things that come along with it. Hmm. And speaking of headache, Alice, so what's some of the biggest challenges you faced while you were developing Owlish and how did you overcome them? That is a great question. Learning to work with developers was hard because when I was working with developers in the past, which I obviously have, it was more like, I want this done. I wasn't building a software from scratch. It was just a website and it was more design things or little functionality things. When you're building a software from scratch, you're starting from a blank slate. That is such a blank slate. And what I realized is, just how many development hours and time and effort and thought, really deliberate thought goes into any piece of software that we use, like a Calendly or a Zoom or a StreamYard or any of these things where we take it for kind of granted, right? Like Gmail, like, oh, of course it works. Like, Oh, yeah, of course. And it's like, if the user experience is off, you're just like, why is that button not working? Or like, why is this thing not working? And it just feels like everything should be really seamless and very obviously working. I thought that was easy. <laughs> I did not think that that would be a challenging thing to code together. And I very quickly learned that um, I was in La La Land and I realized like, oh, this is why there are softwares that have like a really bad experience. I had never understood why there were like these kind of outdated looking or outdated feeling softwares that it, it, it didn't, it wasn't even like, didn't even have to do with like when they were actually last updated, but it was just like the overall experience of the software when, when you, when you're using a software, that's just not great. It's just like, why is it like this? Well, like in this day and age, it's like, it's 2022 or 2023, like software should be, you know, like really seamless. And what's the big deal? They should just redo this whole thing. Oh, I, I learned really fast. And I learned how to stand my ground <laughs> and push my developers to figure out how to make it work for the non-technical person. It's It was a challenge because I'm a non-technical person and I would do these wireframe mock-ups with what seemed to make sense for me. As a non-technical person, like I needed this to work like this. I couldn't have had, I, it was not okay to have layers and layers of settings where I didn't know where to change something. It was not okay to not know where to go to do something. It had to be easy for the non-technical person to just go in and be like, okay, well, this is a new piece of software for me. It's a little still intimidating because it's new, but oh, it's pretty straightforward. And oh, okay, I get where to go to do this thing and need to feel empowering. But to make that happen meant a lot more development that would be needed if I then if I were to be okay with a uh, mediocre, <laughs> mediocre experience for the user, if I must put it that way. So when you piece, see a piece of software that's just easy and seamless and just goes, that is a testament to a um, unthinkable number of development hours going on in the back end to make that happen for the front end. I learned that really fast and I learned to really push back and challenge the developers that I work with to figure out how to make that happen versus settling. Settling. Yeah, it's it's really settling knowing that the user experience is more subpar um, and you know, it's, it's challenging, but it's easier to make it work from a technical standpoint. So yeah, I, I guess I learned it by really trial and error, um, and all of that kind of things, but stand your ground, make it happen and just 
being insistent on having it done that way. And I am absolutely no Steve Jobs, but I kind of could see how, you know, like they talk about he has a reality distortion field where all of the smart people around him would tell him that something is not doable, but he would be like, no, figure out how to do it. I'm I'm certainly not to that point at all. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I could kind of see how that was needed for for somebody like him to make devices like the Ali Apple products that we love and depend on. It was only possible because he was so insistent on on the little things that made the experience really smooth for for the end user. Awesome. So ISO. You being a former dentist, how, if any, has that experience in the field influenced your approach to developing an educational platform? I was a course creator of dental topics. And so, and I was not technical and neither were my audience, right? And so first thing that I think that came from that real experience is how because I was such a heavy user of online courses since 2013. This is like, makes me really dated, but that's when our first course launched. And we've had courses, you know, launched new courses, revamped the courses, redone uh, the websites, et cetera, et cetera, from 2013. So I've used course softwares and tried all the things for so long that I think I've developed a really good idea of what the course creator's experience needs to be like. So that's one. But then not from like the the course creating standpoint, but from the dentistry standpoint, I think I've learned and brought over two things, two things the most. One is attention to detail. In the world of dentistry, a millimeter is huge. It is a big distance, like it's nothing, right? And I think the only other field, or I mean, yes, there's more fields that are like that, but in the medical field, the only other field that goes more into more detail into those like little increments of distance is like neurosurgery, where like a micromillimeter is too much. But other than that, dentistry is the field where the smallest of details matter. They really like... um treatment success or failure in like the next five years will be determined by like how that like even half a millimeter was taken care of. Um, And so when you study that field for 10 years, (laughs) then go to school twice and see patients for a while and teach that even when I wasn't seeing patients, I was still teaching dentistry. It's like you can't get past that those little details like they bug you you kind of become a perfectionist I and I I don't say perfectionist in a good way by the way because perfectionism I think is uh not very good (laughs) in in making things actually happen but I've I've tried to really focus shift that to like 80% good enough is good enough uh so that actually projects can move forward um but yeah that attention to detail is is a huge one and I think it's the main thing that I brought over from the actual field of dentistry itself and maybe the second thing I brought over from the field of dentistry is just working with people like reading behind the lines like if I'm sitting with a patient for instance and talking about what their hopes and dreams were with their like why they came, right? Like some somebody might not have visited a dentist for five years, 10 years, and they came. And then, and if they're in pain, for instance, then they're, it's obvious, like you had to come. But if they're not in pain, I found it important to get to an understanding of what motivated you to actually make this decision that you didn't make last year, something shifted in your thoughts, in your heart, something. You want something out of this visit. You want something from me and you're hoping for something. What is it? So you had to like get pretty good at having short conversations with people and getting to the heart of the matter of their hopes and dreams and needs and fears of, let's say, what held you back in the f- past five years, 10 years from coming in. So that that kind of conversation, I don't want to call it tactic, but like just getting to the heart of the issue fast is certainly a skill that I picked up practicing dentistry. 
Uh, yeah, talk about those small details. I mean, I've watched my orthodontist um, as he tries to, you know, apply the brace and try to figure out, okay, where do we move next? And all of those things, I'm like, huh, there's just so much science involved in this thing, you know? <laughs> Yes, once you start looking at it with those eyes, it's like, oh, everything that you just thought, like, oh, you just thought an orthodontist just does this thing, except the orthodontist is making the decision this way, like, which direction to, like, the nth degree, you know, do I pull or push or slightly rotate? Yeah, yeah, I know, I get it. I just, like, both of you know, I've had braces, so. (laughs) Ah, yes. Okay, so. Uh, For somebody who wants to create an online course but has little to no technical knowledge, what advice would you give to that person? Start simple. And I really mean this from the bottom of my heart where when as entrepreneurs, as you're dreaming up what this course of yours or this business of yours that involves now involves online courses could look like we tend to dream of a potential finished product we dream of like what it would look like when we get there when it's finished and that is big it's it's a huge thing right it it will be but the thing is when you're starting out just taking any action in the simplest matter of things really is the fastest way for you to learn. So for instance, if you don't yet have an online course, instead of thinking about making a huge flagship kind of online course that, you know, you'll be charging your, your learners a lot for, et cetera, et cetera, to start and, and those take like months to build. And this is the biggest reason. Those take months and months to build. And you're building kind of in a silo. Usually you don't really know if this is how your learners will like to learn this topic. Or you don't really know if you're really hitting the nail on the head. And all that things. There's so many things that you don't know that you think you know. That you're making guesses. And you're doing so much work based off of those guesses. And that is often turns out work that needs to be redone later because you, we missed the mark. And in doing anything entrepreneurial, some guesses have to be made, but you want to reduce the possibility or of having to redo a bunch of work or really you don't want to go down the long road, the wrong road for too long because what a waste of time and effort and just your morale that is. So when you're just starting uh, thinking about doing your first course, just think about what is the easiest, simplest way that I can get something that resembles a simple online course out the door. And doing that will teach you so much. It will teach you just how to like outline and do the course. And it will show you not just that, but also how my, with the interaction that you have with the learners, like how, what What kind of teaching style resonates with my learners? And as you teach, you really do get better at teaching the same material. As you talk about the same topic over and over again, it's like every time you get practice and then you tweak a little something and then you teach it a little better next time. All this stuff is really important. And so I think the best thing to do is for you to just get those reps in and just just get started. So just start with a simple little course and just get it up. Like don't complicate it. Whether you want to get it up on your own website or uh you know like a, a secondary website like those are just like minor details. There are rarely decisions that cannot be reversed down the road. It is okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, if you mess up something in the recording, you just redo that video and, you know, replace that. Whatever. Everything is fixable. And so don't sit on it too long. Give yourself a really tight deadline. And what I like to do, and this is what I did with my first course launch, is I sold it first. I sent out, I put up a a landing page slash sales page. I sent out an email saying, Hey, I'm thinking about building this thing. If you would be interested in it, if, um, if you do buy it, you'll have access to it in two weeks. 
And um, if you buy it now, then it is half off. And here's the link. And if I don't hit the number of people I need, you will get a refund. I will not be building this thing. I just was like, this is what it is. You want it? Take it. <laughs> if you don't want it, leave it. Tell me your interest level. And I did so by actually gathering the money, right? And what that did was it gave me a hard deadline that I had to deliver this thing, whether I liked it or not. I made the promise and it was going to happen. And the first version of the course wasn't perfect, but it really got me going and it brought in enough money to be like, ooh, <laughs> there's something here. And it made it worth it for me now to improve upon it. So anyway, what I really want to say is just start simple. Start where you are not you know this is not your best product, and that is absolutely okay. Do it live if you want to. Um, I think first version courses doing recording live works really well because you have a live audience to interact with. Um, whatever works for you to get something out by a certain deadline, and that deadline should be no more than like two weeks. If it's if you think the project will take longer than that, then maybe dial down and dial back the uh, extent of to what you your course is creating so that it is deliverable in a week or two. And really the recording shouldn't take more than two days, three days max for your first course. That is the mini course um, that it is. Because this is really for you to learn and to interact with your audience and yeah, to, to see, to see, to get your feet wet instead of trying to like learn how to surf by uh, watching YouTube videos, just get in the water, right? <laughs> and start surfing a little bit, even if it's not the big waves you see yourself surfing in down the road, just get going. Awesome. So, so my final question to you, Alice, so is what are your plans for the future of Owlish and how do you see the platform evolving over time? Owlish is, I, I've started many businesses in the past 10 years. Uh, most of them, either I had to stop in the middle, with, even if it was like profitable because it just didn't float my boat anymore, or it just didn't, it was just a flat failure. I've had both. I've never had so much fun as I am with Owlish. It is different as even though it's funny, right? Because I'm a non-technical person and I'm making this thing, but I believe in, and I really love the empowerment that it gives the non-technical founders. Like I love the mission of it. And I, it, it's like, I have two kids, but it's like my third baby <laughs> of like every single thing that's on there, I dreamed of it. And it was a huge process to make it happen. And so I, because I see all the things that went into this, it's like a little art piece, if you will. Um, I want Owlish to be the one business that I run in the next, let's say five years. Um, yeah, I absolutely love it. And where Owlish is going is we are adding more features. There are there are features that I really wanted to have that it does not have yet. And so we are still working hard on it. And to make the improving the user experience, it's a gradual process as people, let's say we we take a step forward, right? And then people use it and the people are like, oh, like, I thought this, or I thought that, or you, you have to take that first step. And then you realize like, oh, okay, let's improve it even further this way. You can't, I learned that you really can't try to make it the final product from the very beginning. I'm guessing. Um, I need my user's input to be like, oh, even though I'm a non-technical person, I'm just the N of one. And I need the, uh, the, the rest of the people's brains to help me improve this product further. So yes, Owlish is, and probably I think all softwares are like that. If it's in the, if it's actively being developed on, it is always a work in progress. And so, cause when I started this thing, I didn't know this, right. And I thought that I would just make it and maybe release some big features here and there, but I didn't know of the constant, like as other platforms and not just online course platforms, but as software as a whole gets better and figures out how to provide better user experience, then the whole standard for 
everybody increases, right? Because like, oh, Calendly is so simple. Schedule once is difficult now. Schedule once used to be kind of like um, assumed as in like an easy platform to use. Compared to Calendly, it is a lot more complicated. You ditch Calendly and you go to, uh, you ditch uh, Schedule once and you go to Calendly. This kind of thing happens, right? And so as the software standards for just generally everything improves, Owlish has to constantly like stay on its toes and improve along with it. So it is so much fun and it fills me like nothing ever, ever has. So I think I've really found my muse, if you will, in, in this little business of, of mine and my partners. And uh, yeah, so that's what I see for Owlish. And that's, that's how we are. We're taking on the direction of it. Sounds Fantastic, Alice. I'm really proud of what you've accomplished. Um, just in my mind, imagining you being in dentistry and now doing this is like, ah, chocolate cheese, but it works. <laughs> it works. So kindly of share with us your contact details, as well as I know that in the when, when we first connected, you mentioned you have some giveaways, um, free, free sign up for Owlish. So go ahead and share that with us, please. Absolutely. We would love to offer your listeners two months free to our platform. And to claim that, just head on over to owlish.com forward slash Henneka. Does that work? Is Henneka yes. the good URL? Okay. Yes. Yes. That's what I was thinking. I should have talked to her first. But... <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So Owlish is spelled with two W's. So O W W L I S H dot com forward slash Henneka, H-E-N-E-K-A, and uh, put in your name and email address and you'll get two months free of a platform. And my hope is that that is enough time for you to try and just play with the platform, see if it fits your needs. And if it doesn't, then cool. Like, I'm glad you got to try it out. And if it does, then we would love to help you take your business to the next level and help you get courses onto your site and all that good stuff. And I personally am kind of a hermit on social media. <laughs> I don't really do it. Um, but I am the person behind Owlish's email. So if you send any emails through our contact form or uh, Facebook messages or anything like that, that actually does come to me. And um, you are, I've, if you want to like write in, I would love to hear from you. Just address it to like, Alyssa, hey, Alyssa. And then I, I promise it will come to me and I will get back to you and whatever it is. And yeah, like I'm excited to see where your audience would take their businesses and perhaps incorporating courses into their businesses or yeah like this just if I could inspire somebody to take a little bit of action today then then yes I, I would be very very happy awesome sauce and it has been such a pleasure speaking with you Alisa Alisa Marshall you are the person behind or one of the persons behind Olish uh, software as a service creator and I'm so proud of what you have accomplished, you know? Oh, thank and I, you. Yeah, and I hear the passion with which you speak. So that is even more fantastic. So thank you for stopping by and spending time with us today. And we wish you all the best as you even do more and improve upon what is already a great product as you've worked on it thus far. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Henneka. And I had a blast chatting with you today. Yeah, so we'll keep in touch. Thank Absolutely. you so much for having me. Absolutely. Hey, 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 you are rocking with the Entrepreneur New Podcast. And as you've heard, we've just had the fabulous Alyssa Marshall on the show. Now, what part had you fist pumping and saying yes today? No, Michelle, just hit us up with your thoughts at hennikawatkisporter at gmail.com or slide into my DMs on social media at hennikawatkisporter what is torture and don't forget to hit that subscribe button on your go-to podcast app whichever one that is with all your podcasting needs check out hennikawatkisporter.com and let's keep this party going i close with according to the scriptures today trust in the lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Do what good.